All right, everybody, welcome back. In this episode, we're going to take Ezra chapter 8, and we'll speak of the second return. All right, so in the seventh year of Artaxerxes Lagomanus in 458 BC, just 58 years after the completion of the temple, Ezra led a group of some 1,500 men and their families back to Palestine. So in Ezra's day, Palestine was a part of a larger governmental unit, the satrapy of Abarahara, and was ruled by a Persian sub-governor. Times had been difficult in Judah to reconstruct the agricultural base for their economy. The people had scattered from Jerusalem and had built smaller communities throughout the land. Even the Levites, uh, dedicated to temple service, had built homes and cleared land. So the walls of Jerusalem had not been rebuilt, and the people had begun to intermarry with the pagans of the land. This last act was a serious breach of the Old Testament law, which insisted that God's people remain uh, a separate identity. And this was a very practical law. History will demonstrate over and over again that when the Israelites intermarried with pagans, the sure outcome was the introduction of idolatry. And Ezra was no political reformer. He was, however, a teacher. For Ezra had devoted himself to the study and observance of the law of the Lord and to teaching its decrees and the laws of Israel. Chapter 7, verse 10 covers that. And there was no doubt in Ezra's mind that a fresh start for God's people could be found only in the return of God's word. <clears throat> so we'll just jump into the first 14 verses where the people who came with Ezra to Jerusalem. And we're going to get a list of families so you can listen to me ruin a bunch of these Hebrew names, but just bear with me. So these are the heads of their father's houses, and this is the genealogy of those who went up with me from Babylon in the reign of King Artaxerxes, the son of Phinehas, Gershom, of the sons of Ithamar, Daniel, of the sons of David, Hattush, of the sons of Shechaniah, of the sons of Parash, Zechariah, and registered with him were 150 males, of the sons of Pehath Moab, Elihonai, the son of Zeriah, and with him 200 males, of the sons of Shechaniah ben Jahaziel, and with him 300 males, of the sons of Adin, Ebed the son of Jonathan, and with him 50 males, of the sons of Elam, Jeshiah, the son of Athaliah, and with him 70 males, of the sons of Shephatiah, Zebediah, the son of Michael, and with him 80 males, of the sons of Joab, Obadiah, the son of Jehiel, and with him 218 males, of the sons of Shelemith, ben Josephiah, and with him 160 males, of the sons of Bibai, Zechariah, the son of Bibai, and with him 28 males, of the sons of Asgad, Johanan, the son of Hakatan, and with him 110 males, and of the last sons of Odenakam, whose names are these, Eliphalet, Jeel, and Shemaiah, and with them sixty males, also the sons of Bigvei, Uthai, and Zabud, and with them seventy males. All right, so let's look at all of this. These are the heads of the fathers' houses, and this list is going to include those who went up with Ezra from Babylon. So here Ezra begins to retell the account that was summarized in Ezra chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. So there was little at Jerusalem to attract a new expedition, for the glamour which had surrounded the first return with the son of David at its head had faded in grievous disappointments. And the second series of pilgrims had to carry with them the torch with which to rekindle the flames of devotion. So of the sons of Phinehas, Gershom, Ithamar, Daniel, David, these seemed to be prominent members of the entourage coming from prominent families. The interest of this forbidding list of names and numbers lies in the fact that in every case but one, these groups are joining, at long last, the descendants of the pioneers from Babylon 80 years before. So Shechaniah, uh, there were three of this name. The second is mentioned in Ezra chapter 8 verse 5, and the third is mentioned in Ezra chapter 10 verse 2. They were all different persons, as may be seen from their father's houses. <clears throat> That's kind of difficult to pick up from the text, but we're going to point that out here. And with him, 200 males, 300 males. So adding the counts of the male members of the group together, there was a total count of at least 1,496 men in the group. Adding an estimated number of women and children in Ezra chapter 8, verse 21, we can surmise that the total number of the party coming with Ezra in the days of King Artaxerxes was something like six to 7,000 people. 
So the whole company consisted of 1,496 males, a good addition to those that went up before Zerubbabel, yet nothing so many as might have been, but that they wanted hearts, right? So the list in verse 1 is going to contain the major men or the family heads who returned as well as the numbers of those who accompanied them. Most of the people listed were related to the families who had returned previously under Zerubbabel in 538 BC, which happened 80 years earlier in chapter 2. Right in verses 2 and 3, looking back at this real quick to review, many of the family names in chapter 8, verses 3 through 14, are mentioned in chapter 2, verses 3 through 15. Gershom was a descendant of Phinehas, a son of Aaron's third son, Eliezer, in Exodus chapter 6, verse 25. And Daniel was a descendant from Ithamar, Aaron's fourth son, in Exodus chapter 6, verse 23. The total number of men who returned was 1,514, including the 18 heads of the families and 1,496 other men. With the 258 Levites assembled later in Ezra chapter 8, verses 15 through 20, the total number came to 1,772. With women and children, the group might have totaled between five and 6,000. Even so, this group was much smaller than the near 50,000 on the first return in chapter 2, verses 64 and 65. All right, moving on to verse 15, the lack of Levites in the group. Now I gathered them by the river that flows to Ahava, and we camped there three days. And I looked among the people and the priests and found none of the sons of Levi there. All right, so let's look at this. Ezra was definitely the leader of this group, and in more than a spiritual sense, he led the expedition here. And he found none of the sons of Levi. The Levites were different from priests. The priests came from one family among the entire tribe of Levi, right? The descendants of Aaron. These were the essential workers for the system of the temple worship that Ezra was to promote. And perhaps the Levites were generally too comfortable with their lives in Babylon to go back to Jerusalem, or perhaps they were not willing to go back to their ancestral temple duties that put them under the authority of the priests. Whatever the reason was, Ezra had the money and the authority he needed, but not the men. And so a rabbinic midrash in Psalm 137 relates the legend that there were Levites in the caravan, but that they were not qualified to officiate because when Nebuchadnezzar had ordered them to sing for him the songs of Zion, they refused and bit off the ends of their fingers so that they could not play on the harps. Take that for what it's worth. So the Levites were to function as teachers of the law in Leviticus chapter 10 verse 11 and Deuteronomy chapter 33 verse 10. Therefore, they were to have an extremely important role in the reestablished community. The people desperately needed to understand the importance of the law as they faced their situation as returnees from exile. The Levites would have had a difficult time in the new land for they were to be involved in the disciplined ministry of temple service. Perhaps that is why none were present when Ezra and his group were ready to depart from the canal of Ahava in Ezra chapter 8 verses 21 and 31, whose location is unknown. This canal may have been a tributary of the Euphrates River. Even Zerubbabel had comparatively few Levites on his return in chapter 2 verses 40 through 58, right? So less than 1.5% of the 49,897 in chapter 2 verses 64 and 65. All right, verses 16 through 20, Ezra is going to address the problem of the lack of Levites here. There's going to be a lot of names, so bear with me again. Then I sent for Eliezer, Ariel, Shemaiah, El-Nathan, Jerib, El-Nathan, Nathan, Zechariah, Meshalam, leaders, also for Jerib, El-Nathan, men of understanding, and I gave them a command for Ido, the chief men at the place of Kesipha, and I told them what they should say to Ido and his brethren between... Um, his brethren the Nethanim at the place of Kesipha, that they should bring us servants for the house of our God. Then, by the good hand of our God upon us, they brought us a man of understanding, of the sons of Mali, the son of Levi, the son of Israel, namely Sherebiah, with his sons and brothers, eighteen men, and Hashabiah, and with him Jeshiah, the sons of Merari, his brothers and their sons, twenty men, also of Nethanim, who David and the leaders had appointed for the servants of the Levites, two hundred and twenty Nethanim. All of them were designated by name. So, let's look at this. With this, Ezra is sent back to Babylon for Levites to come and join the work in Jerusalem. He did not accept the initial failure of the Levites to join the group, but he kept appealing for help. And Ezra planned carefully in the Levite recruitment effort. 
He specifically chose the recruiters, nine leaders, and two men of understanding to make an appeal as persuasive as possible. Then he carefully instructed the recruiters as to what they should say and directed them specifically as to whom to make the appeal, right, Ido and his brethren. Indeed, the good hand of our God was upon the recruitment effort, but it was also upon the planning of it as well, right? You can't just sit around and pray that, you know, God perform miracles on your behalf. There is action required on our behalf frequently through Scripture. Action on our behalf is clearly seen. So Ido the chief, the head of the rest, either by ecclesiastical order or government, which the Persian kings allowed to the Jews, or by some grant or commission from the king. And they brought a name... um, brought us a man of understanding, namely Sherebiah. This man responded to the call and led the delegation of Levites. So Ezra sent nine leaders and two men of learning to secure some Levites and the temple servants from the man Iddo. Ezra told the messengers what to say, and which seems to indicate that this was a delicate task which needed to have some weight behind the message. The 11 messengers were sent to Kasifia, whose location is no longer known. And the men were able to secure 38 Levites from two families, 18 from Sherebiah's family and 20 from the Jeshiah's relatives, as well as 220 temple servants. Only then was Ezra ready to start on the important journey. Without the Levite teachers of the law and people to serve at the temple, all would be lost and the trip would be futile. All right, verses 21 through 23, a prayer of protection. Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava, that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek from him the right way for us and our little ones and all of our possessions. For I was ashamed to request of the king an escort of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy on the road, because we had spoken to the king, saying, The hand of our God is upon all those for good who seek him, but his power and his wrath are against all those who forsake him. So we fasted and entreated our God for this, and he answered our prayer. Right, so let's look at this. Ezra understood the spiritual power of fasting as a demonstration of our single-minded devotion to God and His cause. Therefore, he called a fast and saw that he answered our prayer. As with any spiritual discipline or duty, it is possible to fast without a right heart and a, to trust it as an empty ritual. Right, You cannot just have empty ritual. Apart from its true spiritual reality, real fasting or fasting that is partnered with real repentance and isn't only about image has great power before God. Matthew chapter 17, verse 21. So to seek him the right way literally means a straight way, unimpeded by obstacles and dangers. For I was ashamed to request of the king an escort. Ezra had previously expressed great confidence in the hand of God upon him and his expedition. He did not want to contradict these prior words with later actions in asking the king for an escort of soldiers and horsemen. So they needed protection because the danger was real, and there was a constant threat of robbers and bandits, especially because they were transporting so many valuables. Yet, because of their dependence on God, expressed through prayer and fasting, God protected them through this. The voluntary gifts of the king were welcome. They were expressions of the king's sense of the greatness of his God. These Ezra accepted with gratitude. It would have been quite another matter if he had just asked the king to help him to do what he had declared God was able to do for him. Thus, we see that this good man had more anxiety for the glory of God than for his own personal safety. And there is an added interest in the fact that Nehemiah, in his day, would see the matter quite differently, accepting a military escort as part of God's bounty in Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 7 through 9. And so he fasted, and they put their holy resolution into execution. Purpose without practice is like Rachel, beautiful but barren. So first, spiritual preparation was made for the journey. Ezra was concerned with matters pertaining to God's people, so Ezra proclaimed the fast in preparation for the journey. He wanted the assembled group thereby to humble themselves before God in order to ask Him for the safe journey for themselves, their children, and their possessions. Being humble before God shows one spiritual dependence, His acknowledgement that God is in total control. And verses 22 and 23, because Ezra did not want to ask for military protection, soldiers and horsemen, because he had already publicly announced that God would take care of the people as they returned. In contrast, we see, as we mentioned, Nehemiah readily accepted military escort on his way back to the land. Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 9. All right. Verses 24 through 30, we're going to see the distribution of articles to be offered among the tribal representatives. So there are going to be more names here. Bear with me. 
And I separated twelve of the leaders of the priest, Sherebiah, Hashabiah, and the ten of their brethren with them, and weighed out to them the silver, the gold, and the articles, the offering for the house of our God, which the king and his counselors and his princes, and all Israel who were present, had offered. And I weighed into their hand six hundred and fifty talents of silver, silver articles weighing one hundred talents, one hundred talents of gold, twenty basins of gold worth a thousand drachmas, and two vessels of fine polished bronze." precious as gold and i said to them you are holy to the lord the articles are holy also and the silver and gold are a free will offering to the lord god of your fathers watch and keep them until you weigh them before the leaders of the priests and the levites and the heads of the fathers houses of israel and jerusalem and the chambers of the house of the lord so the priests and levites received the silver and the gold and the articles by weight to bring them to jerusalem to the house of our god so wait out to them Ezra divided the valuables among the leaders of the priests, making each of them responsible for their portion. And they were responsible then to watch and keep them until they arrived in Jerusalem and delivered them to the leaders of the priests and Levites there. And these are enormous sums worth millions of dollars. And the king of Persia sent great treasure to support the ongoing work of the temple here. If the God of the Jews were no more than a name, he might have argued, the whole exercise was pointless. But if he existed, he would expect tangible courtesies from a king. And the scale of them should reflect the donor's power and majesty. So... The priests and Levites received the silver and the gold. This took some measure of faith because holding this wealth made them targets for violence by robbers or bandits. They received this responsibility in stewardship. So next, physical preparation was made for the journey. Ezra divided the silver gold and articles among the 24 of the key men in the group. These items were gifts for the temple given by Persian officials and by non-returning Israelites. And they included some 25 tons of silver, silver articles weighing three and three quarter tons, three and three quarter tons of gold, 20 bowls of gold that weighed about 19 pounds, and two expensive bronze objects. All this would be valued at many millions of dollars today, and it's no wonder Ezra was concerned about the people's safety on this journey. So verses 28 through 30, Ezra charged these key men with the responsibility of getting the precious metals and valuables back to Jerusalem safely. In his charge, he said that these material possessions were consecrated to the Lord and that the silver and gold were freely given by God's people. He emphasized the need for guarding the money and articles carefully by noting that they would all be weighed on arrival to be sure that none had disappeared. The priests and the Levites accepted the responsibility of taking the metals and utensils to Jerusalem. All right. Verses 31 and 32, a summary of their departure, uh, departure and arrival in Jerusalem. So, then we departed from the river of Ahava on the twelfth day of the first month to go to Jerusalem. And the hand of our God was upon us, and he delivered us from the hand of the enemy that, and from ambush along the road. So, we came to Jerusalem and stayed there three days. So, Ezra here repeated what is now a familiar phrase, the hand of our God was upon us. God's hand was indeed upon them to protect, guide, and bless them. And God never fails to act in full dependence on himself and so in complete independence of all others so they came to jerusalem this ended the four-month journey from babylon to jerusalem ezra together with the entire group was now in the promised land and the land promised to their ancestors all right verse 33 and 34 precious articles offered to the lord now on the fourth day the silver and the gold and the articles were weighed in the house of our God by the hand of Merimoth, the son of Uriah the priest. And with him was Eliezer, the son of Phinehas. With them were the Levites, Josabad, the son of Joshua, and Nodia, the son of Benui. With the number and weight of everything, all the weight was written down at that time. So, they weighed everything there. And those in Jerusalem expected a proper accounting for what had been sent to from Babylon. We may say that this was more to prove the integrity of the men in Ezra's expedition than to disprove it. So all the weight was written down at that time. They did it all with careful accounting, as is fitting for good stewardship and precious things. And according to Babylonian tradition, almost every transaction, including sales and marriages, had to be recorded in writing. Ezra may have had to send back a signed certification of the delivery of the treasures. And uh, let's see, verses 31 through 34, looking at this, only a few statements were made about the journey and the arrival. The group left Babylon on the first day of the fourth, uh, first month in chapter 7, verse 9, and they left the Ahava Canal on the 12th of the same month. And since they were at the canal three days, in chapter 8, verse 15, the site of their canal encampment was about nine days' travel from Babylon, which was perhaps some 100 to 130 miles away. 
The total journey was about 900 miles and must have been difficult for a group without military escort. However, Ezra was content merely to relate that the hand of God was on us. And you can look at chapter 7, verses 6, 9, and 28, and chapter 8, verses 18 and 22. And that the Lord granted the returnees protection. On arriving in Jerusalem, after the three-day rest, everything was turned over to the priests and the Levites and weighed in verse 33 and 34. Several of the temple officials are also mentioned in the book of Nehemiah, Merimoth in Nehemiah chapter 3 verses 4 and 21, Josabad in Nehemiah chapter 11 verse 16, and Benui in Nehemiah chapter 3 verse 24. All right, verse 35, sacrificial offerings made to the Lord. The children of those who had been carried away captive, who had come from the captivity, offered burnt offerings to the God of Israel, 12 bulls for all of Israel, 96 rams, 77 lambs, and 12 male goats as a sin offering. All this was a burnt offering to the Lord. So these burnt offerings were to propitiate for the general sin and to show dedication to the Lord, right? The offered burnt offerings. The entire animal was burnt as a sacrifice to God. And the 12 bulls for all of Israel, though the tribes there were only Judah and Benjamin, yet they offered a bullock for every tribe as if they were present. And there could be little doubt that there were individuals from all the 12 tribes there, possibly some families of each. And the reason for offering 77 lambs is not so obvious. Whatever conjectures about the perfect number, it may seem to invite. Uh, the sin offering. The sin offering was made mostly with the idea of purification, especially for specific acts of transgression. Taking both sacrifices together, the burnt and sin offerings, we can see that they address both the problem of sin, addressing the general sin problem, and sins, addressing the problem of specific sins. All right, verse 36. The orders from Artaxerxes are related. And they delivered the king's orders to the king's satraps and the governors in the region beyond the river. So they gave support to the people and the house of God. All right, so they delivered the king's orders. This would especially have been the commands of giving special authority to Ezra. In Ezra chapter 7, verse 25, the king's orders, presumably the documents that accredited Ezra as one who was authorized to administer the Jewish law among his fellow countrymen in the various regions of the province. And, of course, they gave support. And this reminds us of the great purpose of Ezra's expedition. In the final two chapters, we will see Ezra administering strict correction as a reformer, but he did not come primarily as a disciplinarian. He came to give support to the people and the house of God, and only dealt with the problems of sin and compromises necessary in the course of his greater goal. Right, so... Looking back, these exiles offered sacrifices to God. There's four kinds of animals, the bulls, one for each tribe of Israel, rams, lambs, and goats. And they were the same as those offered at the temple dedication in chapter 6, verse 17, but now the number was smaller. So a copy of the king's edict was given to the surrounding officials, right, the royal satraps and the governors of the area, who were to carry out his wishes under Ezra's leadership. This caused the surrounding peoples to assist the Jewish post-exile community. These, uh, the section ends in an interesting climax. God's good hand was so evident on his people that even surrounding peoples helped them in the sacrificial system, the means of fellowship with God. And that ties up chapter 8. In the next chapter, we are going to talk about the reform in the land. Thank you for joining me.